Hello, everyone. I'm Patty Gunnell, Vice President of Strategic Accounts, Real U.S. Today, we're here to talk to Vinny Sinascal from Firehouse Productions, who is living currently in the NBA bubble. We thought we'd uh, spend some time with Vinny today talking about how, what he's done there and for several months lived within the bubble. And then, of course, he had the challenge of designing the entire communications and Bolero system for the NBA network. And so I think today we'd like to just spend some time with him uh, to ask him how he did what he did. Vinny, how are you today? Hi, Patty. Doing very well. Thank you. Good. Here Good. on site presently uh, in the arena for... Uh, we're going to be starting game four of the finals this evening. So came in a little early, take you guys through what we've been doing here uh, and how the process came about several months ago. We started work back in, uh, oh, I'm going to say back in March uh, when the NBA reached out uh, to Firehouse. I mean, we've had a long standing relationship there. And uh, normally we do uh, their, their more special events, not their typical day to day. You know, we've done the NBA All-Star on the draft and uh, overseas games for them, things that are not just their standard season. Uh, but when the NBA wanted to restart uh, the 2020 season, it was a special event because it was not taking place in any of their standard arenas. They chose the worldwide of sports down in Orlando at Disney and basically needed three courts to be built from scratch with you know the added need to have pa for the court it originally started out as as one location then grew to two then grew to three and then once they had all that finalized the challenge was okay how are we linking this now for communication so we started in preliminary talks as i said back in like march april and may came around and and we started to bring the team together um brought on uh, Luis Espinal, also a, a firehouse employee who, who heads up a lot of our large projects for uh, wireless and communications. And we went obviously right to artists. And the initial concept was that we were going to have just a, a few frames in one venue. Uh, and then when they added more venues, we were just going to treat them all as independent projects. But as we got closer and closer to coming on site, which uh, we came on site July 1st, So once we got into June and they realized it was going to be two networks, it's going to be Turner and ESPN. So now we're talking about six broadcast trucks across three venues. And then, you know, they wanted as minimal staff as possible, which meant that the venues were no longer going to be independent, that everything was going to be tied together. So we had to rethink, you know, the network from from being three separate shows to being one large show. And that was really where we began. And that was that was uh when we set about looking at the hardware and, the, and, and, and you know, frame count and panel count and fiber infrastructure, uh, which all the fiber infrastructure is provided through the NBA uh, to a third party. So we're really just looking at locations where we have hardware and then telling them our fiber needs and then they're providing fiber infrastructure. Joint effort to bring network this, this large up online. That's intense. Now, now, how long did it take you to kind of start from beginning to end of, of putting that on all down on paper, so to speak? Initially, it was uh, myself and Luis, and then we brought in uh, Scott Hopkins, who also handled all of our uh, internal communication infrastructure. So we, we sat down and put it out on paper, and over the course of probably two to three weeks, came up with the initial system mm-hmm. design, and then we, we came into the shop probably about two weeks prior to coming on site, put it all together, you know, gave it a dry run, make sure that it was all going to work. Um, and then we brought it down to Orlando where we had two weeks to do the install, got it all up and, and, and running, ready for the for the first set of scrimmages. Wow. So. Now, I, I, were there challenges, what were the, I guess, what were the obvious, or not so much obvious, but the, the challenges that came along that, that uh, kind of threw your curve that maybe Riedel was able to help you out with or, or just that you're able to overcome? And- so just getting over the initial design phase of like, okay, it's going to be one network that's going to link all three venues together and all six broadcast trucks. But then in addition to that, the staff that was here with the NBA and with the broadcast companies, they needed to maintain social distance. So it began a series of, of routing efforts to try and make it so that the, the statisticians and the people at the scorer's table, the coaches, could all communicate with each other and with the referees who were on the court, where typically referees would just be running and be relaying information, saying, hey, that was three points or that was, that was a foul. Now there's a large 
piece of plexi that sits in front of the scorer's table, and so they cannot hear. So what we ended up doing was putting microphones on the refs and giving comms to the coaches, and now there's discrete logic functions built in so that the coaches can communicate specifically either to broadcast or to just the statisticians or to just the game caller, and the coaches likewise can communicate to just the, the, the people that they need to speak to. So, and that came, that came after the fact when people started to think about, well, you know, how are we going to be able to effectively communicate with all the social distancing measures that are in place? So, yeah, the, the, you know, the, and then of course there's the redundancy of the, of the artist ring and the logic functions all sort of came together to make it possible. And then, of course, integrating Bolero meant that, you know, we've got a, there was at one point there was 116 users. Uh, on Bolero, so that made it really the only option for wireless communication as well. The environment really became seamless, we'll say naturally, but you know, just in, in design, it was there to expand. Would, is this, would you say you use more logic uh, uh, on this job than normal, or is this about, oh, do you use... Yeah, absolutely. No, there's, there's far more uh, logic built into this than, 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 than project that I've been into. I can jump into the file and, and show you. And so, yeah, you can see here in the left is the tree. So it's, uh, I believe it's a total of 12 frames. And you can see that it's basically uh, four in the arena, three in the uh, in the HP center, three in the Visa center, and two out in the truck compound. The two out in the truck compound, one of which is a 128 and a 64, and that's where we're interfacing all of, uh, all of the six uh, broadcast trucks. And then if you go to the logic function, you can see there's literally hundreds wow. <laughs> of sources and destinations. Um, some, some of the more popular ones are, as I said, um, uh, the, the ref mics, for example. Let me just get to that. So... You can see here's this is just this is from the V so V signifies the visa so there's there's a logic here so that when the ref uh, you know when the ref talk it'll go it'll go from there it'll go to the Fostec so we have Fostec speakers at the scores table inside so that certain members can hear what the what the refs are saying and that's across each venue you'll find. Um, a logic of that nature so when you see when i search by ref you can see the the there's one here for each and now ref mics one ref mic two the arena ref the hp ref so and the visa ref so there's uh, also another logic here uh so It doesn't look like you were going to be able to do a lot of this like pre-planned. You had to do most of this and sort all this out mostly when you got on the job site, didn't you? This was all something that kind of yeah, be. it did. Um, and so you know, you can you can see here we have a status. This is something that's checking the status of the ref mic so that if for whatever reason the circuit for the ref mic doesn't doesn't go open, it's it's updating with the clock of every one second. So um, we're checking on status as well as where as well as routing the mic. Um, so that's a big part of the, of the logic. Some, a lot of these other logic functions that are in here are, um, it's, it's so if any one of these panels goes offline, it will automatically signal a, uh, a beacon back at our home base to let the operator know that if you're there, Hey, the, this panel is offline. Or if you were away, when you came back, it will still flash. Um, so that's, that's what the, the infinite loop function is. So, and then I got, there's a little bit more detail here in the, um, this is the layout of the frames as it goes logically. So the solid lines are the primary fiber loop, the dotted lines are the redundant loop. Um, and as you can see, it, it all starts here at the truck. And then from there, it, it's branching out and I've got a, uh, photo here so this is the actual physical photo of the 128 and the 64 out in the truck compound this is where the fiber patch is made here to make the entire diagram and then this down here is going moving on that would be the bolero uh, which 
primary and a backup spoken hub uh, network for the Bolero. Here you see we've got third-party Ferrofish that we're using to interface, so we're tying entirely analog into these two artist frames. But as you can see, if I zoom in a little bit more here, you can see that we're, you know, Dante to the three Espen trucks, and then this is a spare. Then we were Maddie to the to three of the Turner trucks, and then NBA TV we were interfacing Dante. So, and then here we've got media converters for the various. Some some people were multi mode, some people were single mode. So that's what's going on there. Internally though, we've got it's all Cat five coming analog out of these feral fish into uh, the two artist frames. Moving back, you can see there's a significant number of, of Bolero users, but they're all distributed throughout. The AES 67 cards are distributed throughout the network. So it's not, it's not centralized. Mm -hmm. Decentralized and, and, and the clock is set. So there's, there's, there's no master at the floating, at the floating master on the Bolero side. This takes us into the Bolero. And you can see, again, the primary network solid lines and the redundant network dotted lines. So here's a hub, and then there's three spokes, and a hub, and three spokes. Okay. Uh, we, the the R-Links features on the Luminex to have the, the network in standby over here so that if any one of these branches goes down, one of these branches will pick right up. Did you guys use uh, primarily only Bolero, or were there other other manufacturers intercoms functioning well, at the same time as far as wireless? Hundred percent, hundred percent Bolero okay. uh, between us and Turner and ESPN. Okay. So uh, now, I guess was there any specific obstacle that you had to overcome from a technology standpoint with Riedel, or, or the things that you had to even we had to stretch a little bit there to accomplish, or? or uh, on, in, in the comm system as a whole, or was it just a pretty much just go? Um, there's there's some there's there's some there's some routing that's going on in and out of the the artist matrix. I mean, we've got some external con mixing consoles uh, to do some of the routing functions that we needed to for the ref mics and and things of that nature, even outside the logic functions. But for the most part, uh, it was all handled, you know, internally in the, in the artist. Mm -hmm. uh, the artist has enough versatility between the, the pre-programmed functions and then when you add on top of that the logic function, uh, it was really just a matter of, of, of sitting down and talking it out and drawing it out and, and, and programming it. Now, do you have a process of what you choose to use on a particular job? And I, I, or is it just, you just know what you want to use or just, I, I mean, in, our, in your case, do you just always choose Riedel or do you have other, other systems that you, you know? Uh, there, I mean, of course, there are other options. There are other manufacturers. You know, I, I usually start by getting involved with the producers, and they talk about their vision of what they're going to do. Uh, I get an idea of how many departments, you know, how many how many players are going to be involved, and take notes and, and and look at look at really port counts is where I start. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if we're if we're talking about just you know 10, 20, 30 users, you can kind of make that work in a lot of different ways, but. When you start to get above that number, uh, then I start to, to, to lean into to, to saying, okay, we, we should go with with Riedel products. I mean, most of the time people don't really question it because they're coming to us, they're looking for us to design mm -hmm. what gets done. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a little bit of level of both with the relationship we have with the NBA. Now they know that we're going to be coming using Riedel systems and, and, and that's sort of expected. So, yeah, I won't say that I design solely with Riedel in mind, but uh, I, I'm very familiar with the product, so I, I know where I'm going uh, with that in mind. Let's just put it that way. But we interface, you know, the, the trucks have a lot of RTS and, and Adam still, that's still a legacy product. So we're interfacing that, you know, via Maddie, which as I, as I pointed out, we're using third party uh, products to interface Maddie. But, you know, in the coming years, the 1024, it will interface directly, you know, to artists. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just another reason that we would be leaning on uh, on Riedel products, and particularly the the artist environment uh, with 1024 is going to make it that much more flexible. I mean, it, the, the artist is a powerful system, but 
I think I think it was around 1996 or so that it came out. So using AES3 technology, of course, it's, it's amazing how robust it's, it's been for this long. <laughs> you know, no and now integrated AES67, and then of course uh, fully integrate uh, integration of AES67 with 1024 will be something that we're looking forward to. That's it. it, it it's you know we're definitely becoming a very diverse ecosystem for, for communication. That's for sure. Well, you know, I suspect we probably better let you get back to work. <laughs> we could probably talk all day about your yeah. many projects and all the work that you do. And I certainly appreciate your time, Vinny. And thank you so much for your, uh, you know, your respect of the product, your use of the product, and um, pushing the envelope with it, I'm sure, every day. And yeah. um, can't say thank you enough on, on behalf of Riedel and uh, from a corporate level. I know that uh, you are very valuable to us. So, well, Thank you, Patty. It's nice talking with you, and uh, I hope that we talk again soon. All right. Well, thank you so much, and you have a, a great time, and, and hopefully you get to go home soon. So. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Okay. Thanks a lot, Benny. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.